be unaware of this, but today is actually Palm Sunday, a day that begins Holy Week, a week where we remember Jesus's journey to the cross. Today, we remember something of what God is like, a God who comes on a donkey, not on a war horse, a God who comes to save with sacrificial love. So if you're up for it, you can read the highlighted parts in response. We come to prepare for the holiest of weeks, We will journey through praise with joy on our lips. We will travel through betrayal and death, cradling hope deep in our hearts. Jesus leads us through this week and we will follow for he is the life we long for. He is the word who sustains us. We wave palm branches in anticipation. We lay our love before him to cushion his walk. Setting aside all power, glory, and might, He comes, modeling humility and obedience for all of us. Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is the one who brings us the kingdom of God. Before we hear from Pastor Andrew, we want to 
take a moment to hear from each other and practice generosity together. If you have any prayer requests, praise reports, or if there are ways that we can serve you, there is a Your Our Story section of the online page you can fill out. And now let's practice generosity together. You can text the word Sanctuary RI to 77977. Again, Sanctuary RI to 77977 and select your congregation or give at sanctuaryri.org slash online. Now let's take a moment and remember why we give together. There is nothing we have that we have not received. To spend everything on ourselves and to give without sacrifice is to walk the way of death. But generosity is the way of those who call Jesus their Lord, who love with free hearts and serve with renewed minds, who withstand the delusion of riches. We are determined to increase in generosity until it can be said that there is no needy person among us. We are determined to be faithful stewards of such a little thing as money that we may join God in the work of renewal. Above all things, we are determined to be generous because our Father is generous. It is the delight of His daughters and sons to share their Father's traits and to show what He is like to all the world. Hey everyone. Before I jump into the text today, I wanted to draw your attention to just a couple things. Uh, first is the website, sanctuaryri.org, our home website, sanctuaryri.org backslash corona. Uh, so here we have a platform that is meant to just help people. A few weeks back, we asked the question, what do followers of Jesus do in a crisis? What, what have we done uh, traditionally and throughout history when we look at our, our scriptures, when we just ask what it means to be an apprentice or a follower of Jesus, will we run towards it? What does it look like for us in this season to run towards uh, the coronavirus, run towards this pandemic? And uh, so we asked, would people sign up and enlist to be available to help? People who are just raising their hands and saying, yeah, you can call on me as needs come in and as needs begin to diversify. Uh, and so there's a button on there. We just wanna encourage you, go and sign up and say, I would be available to help and here are the ways I could help. Uh, there's a second button on there that we wanna just encourage you to utilize by spreading the word about this platform. If there are people who have needs, we wanna be able to, to meet them. And then there's a third button where you simply can click and give. We think this is actually a moment for the church to be more generous than ever in a time where I think our collective human instinct and propensity is to, is to hoard and to take care of yourself. There is something uh, important about us following Jesus into just being sacrificial givers and lovers of our world. Uh, and so we wanna invite you to, to join us in giving there. Already, there have been so many of you who have stepped up and who are helping organizations that are doing incredible work. Uh, we have been aiding in some nonprofits who have had some serious needs, helping with the homeless, um, taking care of the elderly, groceries uh, that have been delivered to so many people, so much money that has gone out already and taking care of people's rent, counseling, pastoral care. Uh, so I wanna actually encourage you, keep your eye on social media, on Instagram and Facebook in particular. We're gonna be sharing a bunch of highlights, uh, things that have happened and things we can share. Um, but we just um, sadly um, expect for more needs to come in. Um, and just more opportunities for us to be generous with our time and energy and resources and money. And so I just wanna encourage you to go there and engage in that site. Second announcement is uh, Easter is next Sunday. So on Easter Sunday, we're gonna be broadcasting and we're preparing a whole bunch of things for you to, um, to help you get the word out about this. On Easter Sunday, so many people who aren't regularly a part of a church or uh, maybe aren't even followers of Jesus, but there's something uh, about family tradition. There's some bit of comfort uh, and ritual about going to Easter Sunday. And so we wanna just help connect with those people. And so we've created a website, easteronline.live, easteronline.live. And that'll be just an easy place for you to share the broadcast We've got all sorts of special stuff planned and all that. Um, and then there's also gonna be a Good Friday broadcast as well that we'll be letting you know about. Uh, and then there's one more thing before I forget this. Um, we are doing a, uh, what's it called? A doorstep egg drop. 
So we usually do a big Easter egg hunts or different neighborhood Easter egg hunts at Sanctuary East Side and North and Down City and try to find ways just to just celebrate the goofiness of the season. Uh, and we're not able to do that this year. Um, so there's a whole platform that you can go to. Again, our website backslash uh, egg drop. And uh, it's there that uh, you can sign up to basically have your pastors in full on hazmat suits, drop off Easter baskets and all sorts of other things. And you can learn more about that there. All right, we are gonna jump into the teaching. And before we do that, I wanna invite us to pray. Pray this prayer we've been praying as we begin our teachings um, the last couple of weeks, simple prayer. It's a prayer of openness. Um, it's a prayer of surrender. It's a prayer of, um, I don't know, a prayer of expectancy. So it goes simply like this. And so if you wanna close your eyes and bow your head and pray with me, I'd encourage you to. We pray, God, would you open our eyes that we would see you, see you in this story, see you in the text, Lord. We pray, open our ears, Lord, that we would, that we would hear you. Lord, we believe that um, in some beautiful way, you're, you're still speaking. And Lord, we pray that you would open our hearts, Lord, that we would encounter and know and relate. Um, Lord, that we find ourselves both challenged and encouraged as we wrestle uh, with the scriptures today. In Jesus' name, everybody at home said, amen. So uh, if you did not know, it is Palm Sunday. The Palm Sunday account is a tough one to summarize quickly. There is so much happening right below the surface. First, there is the Roman Empire, which rules the world from England to India. They are declaring peace all over the place by making war on various regions. Pontius Pilate, is the Roman official that is in charge of Jerusalem and the surrounding area, which is the context for the Palm Sunday story. There is the Jewish people who sit at the center of the scriptures. They were blessed to be a blessing to the world. Uh, They're occupied by Rome and they are uh, wondering just sort of as a community where God is, what they have done to deserve this exile and oppression. There's Jesus, who is a Jewish rabbi who's making all sorts of bold claims about being the Messiah, the King. Other people are making even bolder claims about him, somehow being God in the flesh. Uh, as he uh, begins this slow journey to Jerusalem, everything in these accounts about the life of Jesus begins to slow down and we get all sorts of details as he sort of enters um, the epicenter of his story. So a few more things you should know before we read the Palm Sunday account together. In the city at this time, it's Passover, which is this incredibly important celebration for the Jewish people. Uh, in the book of Exodus, uh, or if you want to catch up on the story, there's the Prince of Egypt. There's also the Exodus movie, uh, but the Charlton Heston version, not the Christian Bale one. Uh, we read about, or we can watch this uh, account, this really famous account of of. God through Moses setting these Hebrew slaves free. We read in Exodus 3, 7 uh, that I have, the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters, taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings and I've come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey. The cry of the Israelites has now come to me. I also have seen how the Egyptians oppress them. So come, I will send you to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt. So the Jewish people living in the land of Egypt, enslaved by Pharaoh, and God sends someone to them that he uses to set them free. God rescues helpless slaves from a foreign oppressor. This is just important to note as we keep going. And so once a year, 200,000 Jews would roughly would gather to celebrate. So if you are Rome, you are not excited about Passover. You, uh, Pontius Pilate's job is to maintain order. And here they are celebrating something that doubles as like a cry of hope to be free from Roman occupation. You do not want them celebrating too loudly or for too long. Your job as Pilate is to keep these people well behaved. And if you know 200,000 people are coming to Jerusalem, how do you send a message that basically says, don't even think about it? So 
Pilate's got a plan. Once a year, Pilate would leave his home in Caesarea Philippi, march into Jerusalem, and send a message basically that says that do not mess with Rome. Let me give you a picture. It would begin with a Roman eagle displayed out in front, uh, saying that the, the, the parade is coming. Uh, then came the standard bearers with flags of all the different Caesars of their divine titles, listing all the battles that they won. Then there'd be the centurions, the legionnaires, the cavalrymen. Uh, then uh, there are these accounts, all these accounts of soldiers marching with metal shields, kind of rhythmically clanking them in unison. I just imagine some scene out of Lord of the Rings. Soldiers mounted on horses. Uh, and at the end of the military parade, you would see these armored chariots, which were basically the M1 tank of their day. And at some point, Pontius Pilate himself would go by proclaiming, hail to Pilate, hail to Caesar. And then this phrase that was minted on coins, it just says, Caesar is Lord. It's just worth noting that every time you read that phrase, Jesus is Lord in the scriptures, you are watching or reading political subversion of the empire. What Rome was doing was a show of force. It was a display of power, sending a message that literally, quote, resistance is futile. And another famous line was submit or die, friendly, friendly people. They even had a form of punishment for those who push back, arguably one of the worst ways that humanity has ever cooked up to kill another person. And that was the cross. Everything is about power and strength and domination is meant to evoke fear. And so one last detail, this parade, this vision, you could say of, of what makes the world right, right? Is it power over or not? This parade entered Jerusalem from the West. So if you're taking notes at home, just note the Roman parade, the Roman military parade enters from the West. So the same week, something else happens. So again, before we read the story, just a few more details. First, we learn that Jesus is on the east side of the city. We learn that the crowd is shouting in anticipation of him coming in. They're going, blessed is the king. Blessed is the king. Real quick, just for the folks at home, like what word should, not, should you not be using and shouting right now as the Roman army enters the city? Yeah, that's right, the word king. Like a large crowd of people are shouting about another king. This is not a good thing. And we read again in the scriptures that some of the religious leaders rebuke them, telling them like, be quiet. This is not going to go well for you. So with a little bit of that context, I wanna read the story and I'm gonna stop a couple times through to give you some more context because there is so much going on below the surface. Matthew 21, 1 to 11, if you have your Bibles with you. Matthew 21, 1 to 11. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you and at once you'll find a donkey tied there and with her colt by her, untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say to the Lord, uh, say, sorry, that the Lord needs them and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, see your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, on the foal of a donkey. Now, this quote is from Zechariah, which is a book in the Old Testament, part of the Hebrew scriptures, and it includes a bit more. A normal thing in Jewish writing is that you would just read the opening passage. It's called the remez. You would read the opening passage and it would really though be referring to the whole part. They would have continued the quote. It's like, we're gonna read a piece of this and this, uh, this should trigger the whole section. So this is what the whole thing says. So Matthew here quotes, see your king comes to you righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Verse 10, I will take away the chariots of Ephraim and the war horses of Jerusalem and the battle bow will be broken. And he, this king that they're prophesying about will proclaim peace to the nations. A chariot is a symbol of war. Ephraim was a symbol of the Jews and this king will take away the weapons of wars from the Jews and declare peace to the nations. 
You can see already how charged this is. Let's keep going. The disciples then went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. Because we all know we can't ride on a donkey without some, you know, solid cloaks. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road and while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. We read another gospel. These are the palms. So what about these palms? Why are they cutting branches, laying them on the road, waving them about? The Jewish people uh, had always suffered uh, under some sort of foreign power. Alexander the Great, the Syrian Empire, the Greeks, now the Romans. Somebody always was in power over them. Uh, And in all that time, there had only been one successful revolution led by a man named Judas the Maccabean who had defeated the Syrian Empire. When Judas uh, processed back into Jerusalem, the crowd celebrated him by waving palm branches, which is a whole other story. At some point, he minted coins and stamped a palm branch on them. And so we know just from history that the palm branch became a symbol of Jewish rebellion. Jesus is entering. He's entering in this way that's quoting Zechariah, which talks about a king coming. They're waving branches, saying, uh, I mean, hearkening back to this time of this revolution. And they're missing the bigger piece of the, the kind of revolution. And it seems the, the kind of kingdom that Jesus is interested in setting up. Verse nine, the crowds then went ahead. And those that followed him shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Now this is a song that the Jews sang at the beginning of Passover. It's taken from Psalm 118, the most quoted Psalm in the New Testament. And you know what it's all about? It's about an enemy swarming like bees and driving the writer to the edge of destruction. And then God sweeps in and wipes out the enemy. The word Hosanna means Lord, save now. They are asking Jesus to drive out the enemy army and restore order. And then it says, when Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred. The whole city was stirred. If you're taking notes, just underline, circle the word stirred. All right, there's a lot, a lot of history, a lot of the text. Let's catch our breath for a minute. The crowds thought they were welcoming a king who would overthrow the Roman Empire. And as the Roman guard enters from the West, you have Jesus entering from the East, dropping these references about the new kingdom and a new way. Now the crowd gets one thing right. Jesus is the one who will subvert this oppressor. He's the one who will reign as king, just not in any of the ways they expected. Jesus was gonna make peace but through sacrificial love, dying for the sins of the world, showing them up close and personal what God and his kingdom was like. So when the crowds realize he isn't going to do what they thought he was going to do, they turn on him. And you know what? It's worth noting Jesus is actually, is heartbroken. He's heartbroken that they don't see it, that they don't get it. It's like he knows they're going to turn on him. In Luke 19, 41, it reads, as Jesus approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it. And he said, if you, even you, had only known this day, what would bring peace? But now it's been hidden from your eyes. If you had only known what really brought peace. There's a whole other sermon there for our current moment. If we had only known, you see the God of the universe weeping over his people. On November 9th, 2016, New York Magazine published an article on the science of disappointment. The article opened by stating what is probably pretty obvious to most of us. They said that, quote, the feeling of being let down is actually one of life's toughest emotional experiences. Basically, that disappointment is disorienting. 
Now, being a pastor for a few years, I've seen what disappointment does to a person. Seeing people be betrayed by someone who they'd been committed to their whole life, being cheated out of a job by a colleague. Uh, maybe it was the child that you had prayed for since birth, storms out of the house, swearing to never return. Forgetful birthdays, withheld apologies, lies from someone you die for. It's a great list. <laughs> What's interesting to name about the article is that it says that the experience of disappointment is physiological, not just emotional. Disappointment is linked to your dopamine levels, which is your brain's pleasure chemical. It gets released when things are awesome. <laughs> Something else interesting is that dopamine, um, and what it does in your brain is, is it, you, you don't just react to what you experience. They attempt to predict what you want or what you need. Your brain generates expectations about the future. And often these expectations are based on what you want. So something that you perceive as good has happened in your past. So you begin to expect that it will happen in the future. And before it even happens, your dopamine levels begin to rise and, uh, in the rush of anticipation of this good thing happening. Then when that good thing actually occurs, you get a double shot of dopamine. You probably already see where I'm going with this. That doesn't always happen. In fact, life doesn't regularly give you what you expect. People fail us, people hurt us, people are selfish, you're selfish. And when you don't get the result that you want, researchers call this reward prediction error. Reward prediction error. Not only do your dopamine levels fall, they crash from the heightened level that your expectations had raised you to. So instead of receiving this sweet double shot of dopamine, you receive nothing and you crash twice as hard. So the article goes on to say that not only do you not get what you wanted, but you also feel the, the displeasure of having been wrong. Basically, losing hurts even worse when it's not what you are expecting. I say all this because I think it's safe to say that the crowd's dopamine levels are cranked as Jesus enters the city. The expectation that Jesus is this king who will overthrow Rome is everywhere. The expectations about how life is gonna be. I imagine dinner tables and all the mumblings and murmurs and whispering of like, it's all gonna change. And it is, just not in the way that it seems the crowd expected. And if we read on their expectations, their view of who Jesus is and what he is going to do and how he is going to do it come crashing down. The parade, Jesus on a donkey walking into Jerusalem, that parade becomes a trial. The trial becomes an execution on the cross. Jesus enters the city in this humble way on a donkey, but he will leave in a body bag. The crowds embrace Jesus with dopamine levels soaring and they just shout, save us now. And as soon as Jesus turns out to be something other than the savior they expect, the cries of Hosanna turn into cries of crucify him, crucify him. The way the Palm Sunday account plays out seems to epitomize the transition from expectation to disappointment. And maybe for some, for some who are in the crowd, their disappointment was actually disillusionment. As I read that account again, just kind of going over it this past week, I realize I'm reading the story of a community having their vision and expectations, their view, their whole view of reality taken away. They are disillusioned. So let's, let's stay on this word for a minute. It's a hard reality. It's a great word. Disillusionment is simply the loss of an illusion. Disillusionment, the loss of an illusion. It's what happens when you take a lie about the world or a lie about yourself or a lie about those you love, or in this case, a lie about God and how things are all gonna be and you replace it with truth. 
Disillusionment really is trading lies for truth. My, uh, my dad, he has this funny phrase that uh, he says all the time. It's this kind of joke in our family. And his, his voice, he's a very measured man, and his voice just all of a sudden goes from, I don't know, sort of like mine, all of a sudden to this to a kind of high pitch. And he just says, where, where have I gone wrong? <laughs> where, where have I gone wrong? And it gets higher and higher as he repeats the phrase. Uh, it happens usually when he looks at something we're doing, and, and usually he just means it in fun, but just something really stupid that his sons or daughter are doing. He's just kind of hamming it up. But there's always this little nugget of truth in there. I remember coming home from uh, hanging out with some friends, uh, like one of my best friends in New Hampshire, and we were bored, I don't know, 15 year olds or 16 year olds or something. And uh, we decided that um, my good friend's girlfriend who had pierced his, her sister's ears was going to pierce my ear. And we were just gonna do it at the dining room table. And she assured me she knew what she was doing and she had the ice and the, the needle and the alcohol. And I don't remember the whole scene. I remember it hurt a lot. And I remember they put an earring in and it probably wasn't the best quality earring because I also remember a couple weeks later uh, driving to homecoming and my ear just like looking like a giant red balloon. I digress. I came home from New Hampshire with this earring. I think it looked something somewhere between like Eminem and Justin Timberlake probably at the time, the look was. And I walk like, uh, um, towards the front door. My dad walks out of the front door just to greet me, say hi, say hi to my buddy's uh, mom who had dropped us off. And he just stops and he looks and he just goes, where have I that high pitch? Where have I gone wrong? I remember years later, early 20s, thinking like, oh yeah, we're more like adult friends now at this point, which we were. And I thought, oh, it's safe to start to tell him stories about what happened in high school. Now, my, my, uh, one of my younger brothers would get in trouble for everything. He just did not have the luck of the Irish. He like, no matter what he did, he would get in trouble for, he would get found out, the police would show up, whatever it was. Um, me, I could, I don't know what it was. I just could get away with some stuff. And so I just remember this one weekend where my parents had gone away and uh, it was the weekend where this, all this really big like high school cheer stuff was going on. And so we, uh, I just threw a massive, massive party for my entire class. Uh, and so I'm telling my dad this whole story and how I was really responsible and took all the, you know, all the stuff that was expensive and I hid it in the side room and had friends pick up after. We made everything was good. I'm telling this whole story, thinking we're just gonna laugh about it. And we mostly did. But again, that phrase came out like, where, where have I gone wrong? Where have I gone wrong? I could go on and on with these stories. He's mostly again kidding when he says this, but he is quite literally experiencing disillusionment the illusion of his perfect firstborn son who would never fill in the blank is being blown up. Uh, an illusion that he has, <laughs> sadly about me, is falling away and he's being exposed to truth. Barbara Brown Taylor uh, says that when we are disillusioned, we find out what is not true and we are set free to seek what is. I want to read that again. When we are disillusioned, we find out what's not true and we are set free to seek what is. We can turn away from the world or the lifestyle, the expectations, even the God who was supposed to be in order to seek the God, the reality that actually is. Now, I don't want to pretend that disillusionment is like good times. It can be painful. But I want to point out that it's, that it's a gift, or it can be. There are good illusions to have broken. There are good illusions to have broken. Most of us deep down don't want to live in an illusion, no matter how comfortable the illusion might be for a bit. I'm betting that this pandemic is forcing you to confront some of your illusions. I was talking to a friend about the experience of uh, seeing like empty supermarket shelves, like just again and again and again, where they're expecting all of their normal things to be. The experience breaks our illusion that you're going to, I don't know, that you're not gonna have 
the illusion that you're going to have more than your daily bread, that you're going to have abundance. Maybe it's the illusion um, that your first world existence will go on forever. For many of us, this illusion of control or safety is becoming lost. I remember when my friend Alan died after being hit by a, a drunk driver or when I was in high school and my college age mentor um, and friend died in a, in a horrible fire. These were moments that forced me to engage um, like with the subconscious illusion that I was going to live forever that I think anybody who's young has. The other day I heard someone say, I'm starting to take seriously Jesus's words that we are not promised tomorrow. I just thought, yeah, me too. Jesus' words aren't just about life and death, by the way. They're about tomorrow not necessarily being what you expected it to be. The story of Jesus entering Jerusalem is an object lesson in the mismatch between our expectations and God's answer. God doesn't always meet our expectations, but God always meets our needs. I think that includes the expectations that we have of God. I'm not sure what kind of image of God you've inherited or what expectations you have of God in this season of isolation. But I wanna encourage you that is in times like this, in times of crisis, in times of uncertainty, in times of fear, in times of insecurity, that God offers us his presence. So if we're resolved to step off the dopamine roller coaster and take a posture of surrender, a posture of letting go, of aligning our expectations with the promises of God's presence, we might find ourselves in that crowd shouting, Hosanna, Lord, save us, and welcoming Jesus into the city for all the right reasons. And by that, I just mean that we'll trust the king who came to lay down his life for us to show us what God's like in flesh and blood. And so today we're gonna take communion, which is simply a practice that breaks this illusion that God is far off and not near and not present. I think it's a practice today that that breaks the illusion that God doesn't understand, that God is an impersonal force, that God doesn't weep with those who weep. It breaks the illusion that God is just, I don't know, up there somewhere making a list and checking it twice. We read that just after Palm Sunday, Jesus is with his disciples and he takes the bread. He takes the bread, he breaks it, and he gives it to them, saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And he takes the cup after they'd eaten, saying, this cup is poured out for you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. This act, this, this powerful symbol that Jesus is doing with his followers, with his apprentices, he's saying, you are going to be prone to forget, to forget my presence, to forget who I am, to forget what I've done. As the, the hymn says, prone to wander, Lord, I fear it. Prone to leave the God I love. I always wanna swap that line out, like prone to leave the God who loves who runs up the road. He says, do this in remembrance of me. Maybe today, again, we could just frame it, breaking the illusion, allowing this practice to break the illusion. And so as the team plays a final song, we're gonna just take a moment to reflect on all this. And partway through the song, uh, there'll be a cue to take and eat and drink. And then I encourage you just to stay on with us just for like a minute longer and I'll close out our time together. So as the, the band comes in, friends, might we be deeply moved by tasting the greatest act of love that the world has ever seen. And may our illusions just fall away 
of a God who is anything but love. I take the bread of life Broken for all my sin Your body crucified To make me whole again I will recall the cup Poured out in sacrifice So would you pray with me? We know that you are ever with us, yet far too often we seem to be alone. Our vision can be dulled by our insistence that you come to us as we expect. So help us now to seek only you and not the image of you that we've made. Would you shake the scales of blindness from our eyes that we may see you and your healing power and recognize the touch of your hand. And we know and believe that you, our God, are in our midst today and every day, forever and ever. Amen. Peace be with you.
pray.